I go by a few names. My real my mother named me Mark, but uh, one of my ancestors was named Milo, and uh, there's a story behind that that I won't tell. But so I call myself sometimes Milo, sometimes Mark, sometimes Milo Mark. <laughs> but I am happy to be here today because I get to MC the best. <laughs> this one. <laughs> you guys have the best tellers right here. And you're going to hear it. So we'll start right away. Oh, no, we won't. First, we're going to do this. It will remind everyone else. If you have a cell phone on. That's a fancy phone. <laughs> that looks like mine. <laughs> okay. He loves the outdoors and the people of New England. We're also glad that his grandfather taught him how to play the guitar. He is truly a lover of life, music, and storytelling. So get ready for what I call ear candy. Oh. <laughs> and help me welcome from Keene, New Hampshire, Chris Eklund. <laughs> Everybody, as I, feel, I see the smiles, and it instantly puts me at ease and in a good mood. So thank you for that wonderful introduction, Milo. My name is Chris Eckblom, and I'm from Keene, New Hampshire. And this is my first time at Waterville Valley. And I am really impressed with the mountain backdrop, the drive up here. And everywhere I look, people are smiling. It seems like people are having a good time. So my grandfather did teach me how to play guitar. And this is his old guitar. This is uh, a vintage 1944 Gibson Jumbo J45. And I thought I'd bring this Jumbo guitar because I got a Jumbo story to show. Does anybody here like hear stories? Oh, yes. Okay. That's great. Well, I've been playing guitar and telling stories for the past 10 years, but I've been playing guitar for probably the past 18. And when I was 11 years old, I was very lucky when my grandfather placed this guitar in my hands and I learned how to play it. And I think one of the best gifts we can give our kids is the gift of music and the gift certainly of sharing those stories and those tales with everybody. So today I'm going to be sharing with you a favorite folk tale of mine. It's called John Henry and the Railroad. Oh. You may have heard of this particular story before. I put a little, little extra love into the telling of mine, and I hope you'll be able to hear and follow and feel the love, because that's where the source of this story comes from. So the name of this story is John Henry and the Railroad. A long time ago, when the president was Abraham Lincoln, among many documents he signed, one very important document was called the Emancipation Proclamation. This document basically abolished any form of slavery and prohibited any one man to own another. A very important part of history because now the economy saw tens of thousands of new workers entering the economy with new vigor and new energy. This new free nation was growing. And out of those tens of thousands of freed slaves, John Henry was one of them. The story of John Henry is one of courage. It's one of love. But mostly it's a story about not giving up. John Henry was so tall 
that if you were to take your hands and stretch them as high above your head as you could possibly get them, you wouldn't even reach the chin of John Henry. He was shaped like a wedge. He's broad at the shoulders, kind of narrow at the hips. And one distinct feature that John Henry had besides his size was an immense hammer. A hammer swinging, railroad Thailand John Henry. He had a hammer so big that every time that he swung it up above his head and had it come down, the ground would shake. Everybody thought there would be a storm brewing in the air every time John Henry's hammer started swinging. And it was told that the, the chains that used to bind him as a slave he took and forged into the hammer that he used. That day, when the Emancipation Proclamation came into effect and all these slaves came into the workforce, John Henry's ear caught on the ground that there were railroads being built and that these railroads needed strong muscle men, strong people to lay these ties and to go on day after day working hard in the sun. And you know what's interesting? John Henry found the O&H Railroad and this railroad was offering every single man who invested sweat, tears, and grit into the making of this railroad was given 20 acres of land to call his own. Now for someone like John Henry, who's never owned anything at all in his life before, because he was a slave, this was a pretty big deal. John Henry found his way to the Ohio Valley. that horizon and he saw a green land. He saw a railroad being built south. He saw hundreds of workers working hard, laying those railroad ties down. And he decided that he'd go and find opportunity for himself. And he went down there and he found himself the man in charge. Now John Henry, seven foot tall, as high as you could reach your hands, still not being able to touch his chin. The men working on that gang saw his shadow before they saw John Henry himself. <laughs> <laughs> the foreman saw the shadow and he looked up at this giant silhouette coming up from the horizon. Every man stopped what they were doing. And all the hammers that were swinging stopped to see John Henry coming in. Big silhouetted man comes in and says, who's in charge here? Big barrel tone voice. He looks around and says, Who's in charge? And the foreman that had spotted his shadow before spotting John Henry said, Well, well that, that'd be me here, sir. What, what can we, wow, what can we do for all of you, sir? <laughs> I hear that there is a railroad being built and that any man who puts in sweat equity in this railroad gets 20 acres of land. Now, you tell me, young sir, is that a fact? Well, well, yeah, that's a fact, but we got, we got enough help, and we certainly don't want anything else to do with the sizes of you, young sir. Why don't you, why don't you just go on back where you came from? You and your cane-sized shadow. Well, John Henry wasn't one to back down. Remember that big heart I was telling you about? And not giving up when times seem like they're kind of going against you? John Henry looked at that foreman straight in the eye and says, Mr. Foreman, he looked down said, Mr. Foreman, I can bet you a spot on your railroad gang that I can drive three steel spikes into the ground with three swings. The foreman says, that, that can't be done at all. And everybody around is like, oh, these three swings, oh my goodness. Can't be done. That can't be done, sir. Why don't you keep going back where you came from? And John Henry looked down and he says, well, it should be an easy bet then. If I win, I get a spot on your gang. If you win, I'll go right on back where I came from. Well, the bet was made, and John Henry very carefully laid three spikes out in front. He took his long hammer by his side. He laid one spike in front of the ground. He pulled his hammer up over the head, came down, and he found his mark. over his head and it came down come down a second time top 
off his head, landed on top of the spike. That second swing found its mark too. Gasps swept across the crowd. Everybody in disbelief saw two steel spikes go down with just two swings. A third was all that was left before John Henry got his spot on the railroad gang. That third spike, trembling there in front of him, John Henry smiled at that spike and took his hammer, swung it up over his head, and down a third time. That spike went down in the ground. The ground started to shake. Everybody looked around and they thought they saw a storm coming to town. John Henry's hammer lit sparks. Fire, energy, passion went into every swing. same day, John Henry earned him spot, that place on the railroad gang that he was just reaching for. And that land that he needed, and that he wanted so bad, was now possibly in sight. He could just about taste it. Well, John Henry helped that railroad gang go quicker. And after a few weeks, they were getting closer and closer to Blue Court Junction. Almost reaching Big Ben, right where they were supposed to be. Weeks turned into months, and they were ahead of schedule. They could get to where they were going, that whole railroad gang, before the first of January. They were all going to get what they were working so hard for. Well, one particular day, that track that they were laying and those spikes that John Henry was driving into the ground, that soon began to welcome an unwelcome friend. Those steel rails were like veins, piercing the horizon, going out into the setting sun sky. And riding in on those veins came a steam train locomotive. Now some of y'all know what was attached to that steam train. It was something called a steam drill. Now, if you can imagine, a huge locomotive steel and iron engine. And out of the side of it, there was, a, there was a bar. And at the end of that bar, there was a piston at the end that shot steel spikes with steam straight into the ground faster and harder than any human being could. Well, this locomotive rolled in on the track. And that foreman was able to see in the distance. He saw a shadow coming. And he saw that the locomotive wasn't stopping. And they came and parked right next to everybody there working on the railroad. Excuse me, everybody, said the engineer. He says, y'all going to have to clear out of here now. We've got this machine's going to replace every one of you. Why don't y'all go on home? A gasp swept across the crowd again. How was this possible? We were getting to where we needed to go right when we needed to do it. Well, John Henry, remember that man I was telling you, as tall as seven feet, you can't even reach his chin if you stretch up so high? Well, he ripped down and dug down deep in his heart, and he found courage to once again raise his voice and say, excuse me. Excuse me, Mr. Mr. Engineer. John Henry looked at that engineer and his eyes pierced the engineer's gaze. And he said, I challenge you, man versus machine. If I can get to Big Ben, Virginia quicker than your big bag of bolts there, then we get what's coming to us. We get that land that was promised. If you win, We'll pack up everything that we have and head on back to where we came from. Remember the steel spikes? John Henry wasn't one to back around from a challenge. In fact, he was the one to start the challenges. And he says, I challenge you. If I can get there first, we win. If you get there first, we'll go back right where we came from. And let's do it today. Everybody came up to John Henry came up to the big muscle man, and they said, John, man, this is too big a feat. You can't do it. This is a machine. It's not going to stop. It's not going to stop. John Henry said, neither will I. I won't stop either. He said, John, it's a machine. It's like it's not going to get tired. John said, neither will I. Well, that day, as the sun was setting, and as those steel veins pierced the horizon in the setting sun, a wind started to stir. Knew John Henry was getting ready to swing his hammer. Clouds poured in from the horizon. You could feel the wind faster. You saw
saw a bunch of railroad workers on one side of the track on the left. In the center stood John Henry in his hand. On the right side of those tracks, that big old steam drill sat on its trails. Just sitting and just waiting for John Henry to make the first move. Foreman said, all right, we're going to have a clean competition. we got the steam drill on one side and John Henry on the left. First one to get to Big Ben, Virginia wins. And John Henry took his hammer and he took his size hands like catcher's gloves. He wrapped his hands around that hammer so tight and started squeezing so tight you swear he was trying to sand something down into a toothpick. John Henry was ready. That shadow that stretched down into the valley was slowly beginning to fade as night took over. During those first wee hours of the competition, candle and lanterns lit the sides of those rails, but there was fire burning in John Henry's eyes. Wait! Sit! Go! Swinging hammers, John Henry came in. Sparks flying, wind blowing, the storm coming from the horizon. What's that storm brewing out there? John Henry's camera swinging in the air. Now the steam drill. Moving just as fast as John Henry himself. Neck and neck, they were getting closer and closer to Big Ben. That long night. Last John Henry's hammer swinging and that locomotive steam drill just plowing along right to his left. Neck and neck, they finally got to Big Bend, where they saw in front of them this huge rock, this monolith of sedimentary rock that they had to blast through. And John Henry only had one hammer, and the steam drill was right behind him. So he dug down deep, and he said, all right, Mountain, you're going to move or I'm going to move you. raised up above his head one last time and it came down with more force than you could ever imagine. Driving those, that hammer into the mountain as hard as he could, all you could see was dust. John Henry's hammer went into that mountain harder and harder and harder and you'd swear that storm was brewing up to be a whole tornado. And he crushed it down in front of him, and rock exploded everywhere. And he reached the end of the tunnel. That rock was moved, pulverized, vaporized. The only thing left in its track was a trail full of dust. <laughs> John Henry, standing there, his wobbly self, the foreman came over, the one that doubted his strength, came over and lifted him up on the side. He said, come on, John, we can do it. And John Henry teetering on the two legs that had gotten through a mountain, slowly, clumsily, comes down to the ground and sits. That day, the only thing that people could see or the only thing that people could hear in the sky was John Henry's hammer ringing. And the story, as you're used to hearing, may end there at the cost of John Henry's life. But however, this tale has a different ending because John Henry, he got that land he was looking for. He got that 40 acres of land to call his own because he put every ounce of his strength and every ounce of his gut and grit into making that thing happen. He set his mind to something and he followed through. So these days, if you listen to storms kind of brewing in, you see lightning and you hear thunder, that's just John Henry's hammer ringing in the air.